So Tom, how did you get into acting? Well, I was a relatively late bloomer in terms of getting into acting. Um, I was obsessed with sport when I was at school. Um, but I got to the age of 17 and one of my subjects that I was doing um, towards the end of schooling I wasn't enjoying. Uh, and so I was stuck and my teachers said, you need to do another subject. My old English teacher came to me and she was running the theatre studies class and she said, I think you'd really enjoy theatre studies. I've got 12 girls and I've got one boy. I need boys. <laughs> and I was like, how many girls? Uh, <laughs> That's always how it starts, it was, right? It wasn't yeah. <laughs> particularly the, the best kind of like um, reason for going. Right. Um, but... She was right. I did really enjoy it. And literally after like a couple of classes, I was like, this is, this is for me. Yeah. Um, she then cast me in the school play that year. Uh, and a, a friend of mine's mum, who used to be an actress, came to see it. And she called me the next day and said, I saw you in the play last night. I really think you should think about doing this. Mm. Um, so she sort of conspired with my drama teacher to convince my parents that I should audition for drama school. Um, and I did and I got in and that was basically it. It was pretty sort of seamless really once I'd made the decision. And that was it? Once you, you got bit once right I, away? Once yeah. I was in, I was in. I mean, it's, it's such a kind of, it isn't a job. It's kind of a love and a passion and it's, it's something that's kind of in you basically. Right. Um, and it had been unleashed and I just thought this is something that I want, I'm good at and one I, that I really enjoy. And for me, that was always an important thing in life. Is that you, mm -hmm. I could be good and I was relatively good at all school subjects, but it's mm -hmm. about really enjoying them. Um, yeah, no, that was mine. I, I get it 100%, which leads me to this transition of acting. Um, uh, did you put music on pause to be an actor or <laughs> how did that come about for you? So music in my life was, I mean, was a constant. My mum was a music teacher. Mm, um, I didn't know that. Yeah, my mum was a music teacher. Um, and I my, should know that. I know that. <laughs> and my dad, my dad was a Baptist pastor. Oh, wow. So I grew up, I grew up in the church. Full surprises. I know, yeah. I know. Um, and I play the devil. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I grew up with music around me my yeah. entire life. Um, we, I've got three sisters. We all were sort of put on to instruments at an early <laughs> age. So I played the trumpet from the age of five. And then I, um, I got upgraded to the French horn at the age of 10. Okay. Um, so I played in a lot of orchestras and stuff and I sang in choirs and I sang in church. But that was always something that was kind of something that was put upon me by my parents as opposed to something that I loved. Yeah. Weirdly, kind of music stopped me playing sport on a Wednesday afternoon and that was something that I kind of was begrudging of. Right. But I didn't really appreciate what a big deal it was to have this kind of musical infusion in my life. And then... Yeah, it did kind of go on pause because mm. I went to drama school and what tends to happen, and I, it, it's certainly in the UK and I've found out in the, in the States, it's pretty similar now, that um, if you go to drama school, you are either going to be a dramatic actor mm. or you are going to work in musical theatre and you have to make that decision. Um, and once you've made the decision, that's, that's kind of it. Yeah. So I was on the dramatic acting course and we had like one singing lesson a week, but it was a very sort of standard generic lesson. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas the musical theater people would be singing, you know, every day and, and performing and stuff. So, um, yeah, sort of by proxy, that decision meant that I didn't sing anymore and I, I didn't really sing in my home life. And the, yes, and it seems like in, in England that is, you know, I was raised there until mm. 1980, but I, I know that to be true about the acting back there. It's either you, one or the other, where in America it's not so much like that. You sort of do everything yeah. and, until something sticks. But in England, there's that upbringing where you have to choose because yeah. if you're not a serious singer, then how can you put the time into being a serious actor and conversely the other way around. So it's interesting to hear that you had that same experience. Yeah, and also I think that, that there's a kind of notion that the, the two disciplines are very different. And that's mm -hmm. something I've stumbled across sort of later in my career in terms of the musical theatre acting um, is, is maybe not quite as natural as acting acting. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see that there should be a reason for that. Mm. Um, and that's where I've kind of had success, you know, uh, more recently and, and finding my voice again was that because I had a connection with what was on the page mm -hmm. in terms of um, the lyrics and understanding the text emotionally right. and having kind of an emotional connection to it, then that would, that, that would um, alter my performance right. of the song. What was your first gig? My first theatre gig? Yeah. Uh, well, I was still at drama school, actually. It was, uh, it was a pantomime, which is a big thing in the UK, right. which is like the Christmas show. Right. Uh, and it was Beauty and the Beast in Kirkcaldy in uh, Scotland. And uh, it was with James McAvoy as well, actually. He was oh, my wow. best mate from drama oh, school. Wow. Yeah. And we got let off to go and do this panto for two months. And I played the Beast and the Prince. How was that? It was great fun. I got to sing a Burt Bacharach song. Wait, you played, you played both? I was the Beast for most of it. Okay. And then at the very end, I turned into the Prince. 
Sweet. So you've got, <laughs> you've got, you've got both sides happening both for sides. you. Very great. <laughs> um, and so Tom, tell me about your introduction to American acting and your accents and were you always taking British roles or did you have anything where you had to do and, and have to play an American? <laughs> Uh, well, I've, I've always enjoyed working in dialects. I mean, anyone that's been to the UK knows that there's like lots and lots and lots and lots of different dialects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that was something from an early age, and that might be something to do with having a musical ear or something. But um, it's something that I've enjoyed on the British side of things. On the American side of things, actually, my first American job uh, was very soon out of drama school, and mm -hmm. I played a, an American soldier in it. And I remember going to see the movie, and they dubbed my voice because of my dialects were so bad are you kidding me no. <laughs> only had about three lines um how did that feel i, I was mildly crushed i'm not <laughs> gonna lie blow to the ego. <laughs> um yeah. but but i understand it now i mean the, i had a sort of um revelatory moment uh about six years ago i was doing a play in london called the lions by a, a new york playwright called nikki silver mm. And it had just been on in Broadway, and um, the guy who directed it there came and directed it in London. We had five British cast members. Mm -hmm. and I just remember him one day in the middle of rehearsals going, right, everybody stop, just stop, 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 stop what you're doing. You've got to stop doing American accents and start being American. Oh, that's interesting. And I was like, what, are you, what does that mean? It's like, you know, it's not just about we talk differently, we gesticulate, we articulate. You know, it's an attitude, it's everything. And it's a, a British person being polite with an American accent still, it's, it's, it's jarring, it doesn't quite work. And that was a real kind of, that was a real shift for me because then I, you know, I really sort of took that on board. Mm -hmm. And at the end of that job, I was kind of in my sweet spot. Mm -hmm. um, and this audition came in for a job called Rush, um, which was a pilot of a new TV show. And uh, it was an American doctor and it was, it was just a, a great, great part. And for some reason I felt, I was going to get the part. I don't know why. <laughs> um, I've never really had that overwhelming feeling before. It's intuition. But it was an intuitive yes, thing. Yeah. And, and I just went, I did the audition. I was in, you know, the, the, my dialect work was, was up to scratch at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I got the job. And that was the big kind of, that was the big job for me. That was the one that Say something me. for me in, in <laughs> American. I want to hear your accent. Uh, and I'm putting, completely well, putting you Valerie, on the Well, Valerie, it depends what you want me to say. But if you want me to be Dr. William... P. Rush from Rush, then I can do that for you. I love that. Right. That's great. <laughs> Amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. so that was that was that was the big that was the big shift for me. Yeah. And then I also did a, did something on that job, which I never thought I'd ever do, and be one of those actors where I stayed in dialect from the moment I got picked up in the morning to the moment I got dropped off at so night. So it's more method, maybe. Yeah, yeah. and also mm -hmm. so you're not thinking about it, right? You know, so like a you know a, a musician who does their scales and arpeggios when they're improvising, they're not thinking about what they're gonna play next, they just automatically go there. Yeah. And it was the same for me with dialect work. It was like, as if I am American, I sort of lose the sort of, I lose that sense of the switch and I just am that person. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it worked, you know, it worked. We did, a, we did a whole season on that and I've you know, done several projects in American since then. So yeah, I feel amazing. like I've sort of bridged that gap now. Amazing. <laughs> no we longer shall I be dubbed, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully, right. <laughs> So would you say the voice is as much a part of your identity as your face? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I think the voice for an actor is very much part of their identity uh, because obviously the, there are different mediums with which you work. You know, I, I did a lot of voiceover work back in London for commercials and stuff. So being known for that quality of the speaking voice, for sure. Um, but it's certainly, you know, it's a very, very, very important instrument from the acting front. Right. Um, I d it's, it's a strange one because I don't think of them, I don't separate them for myself. Yeah. Um, but maybe that's just something that's come out of like the last few years of finding my voice again and, and singing again. Well, I wonder too, like sort of transferring over into your role now into Lucifer, mm. um, I want to hear a little bit more about it. I know that we work on it together, which has been really fun and cool. But there's a ton of information I don't know <laughs> about your process as an actor and, and what that role has been like for you. Well, I mean, it, the playing the role of Lucifer has been, it is the biggest role I've taken on in my career so far. And it's, um, you know, it's my favorite job so far in my career for lots of reasons. But I think the, um, the fact that there's so much variety within one singular role mm -hmm. is, is been great for me. And the fact that you know music has been a huge part of it has been great for me. Um, 
when it when it was originally written, Lucifer just was played the piano in his piano bar in Lux. Um, there was no reference to him singing or whatever. But when I was researching the character of the devil, you know, his love and appreciation of music was something that I really sort of tapped into because I love music. Mm -hmm. And um, normally when I'm creating characters, I, I start with a playlist um, of, of songs that might be something that character listens to or something I think might be good on the soundtrack of that thing, mm -hmm. just to get me in the mood. And I'll mm -hmm. listen to that every day when I go into work. So, so I just heard recently a story, and again, I'm, I always tell myself I'm the last to know, but you, so you had said that it wasn't originally part of the show. No. So how did that transpire? <laughs> I'm, was there, is there, there's, there's like a story behind that? What, what so, happened? Um, so Lucifer just played piano, uh, and then we were out, um, I think it was like, we, we just started shooting the first season, and we went out on a social with some of our producers, and we ended up in a karaoke bar in Vancouver. <laughs> Um, yeah, I know where to <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think I did either Mustang Sally or My Way, or probably both. Yeah, um, yeah. depending and, on how many you drinks <laughs> you exactly, had, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and basically, they were like, "Oh my God, you can sing!" Yeah. Um, and you know, before I knew it, they'd written uh, this opening of one of the episodes of me singing Nina Simone's Cinnamon. And so they, they were comfortable, like just completely changing that format and the character. They just well, they thought they'd just take in. it up a notch. I, so I always thought that it was part of the show. I had no yeah. idea until I read a little bit more. No, it just sort of happened by accident. It was a very happy accident. And as was, that was my introduction to you. Because, yes. you know, when they said, well, we want you to sing the opening of this song, we've got you in touch with a vocal coach mm -hmm. called Val. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the beginning of our story. Because, yeah. um, you know... And because it because it went really well, it's become part of the show now. So we, we've had a few songs a season. Well, the music is 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 so good. It's so riveting. And and now I watch the show and can't imagine it not being part of the show. <laughs> you know. So how did your friends and family react to the role? Um, <laughs> well, a lot of people would assume because I'm, I'm in the church or from the church originally uh, that my family would be objecting of this mm. particular role. But I think what I love about my family is that they are the kind of Christians that I really respect, which mm -hmm. is that they live through their own faith and their own example, and they don't mm -hmm. sit and judge and tell people they shouldn't be doing stuff. Love that. It's about peace, acceptance, love, understanding, tolerance, all the great things, and that's what I've taken away you know, in my, in my upbringing. Um, so they were just super excited that I've got a really amazing job, basically. And you know, I think the, the nice thing is certainly my older sister, who's now a pastor as well, oh, she... Wow is a massive fan of the show and also a lot of the people within her church are fans of the show because they realise that the story at the heart of the show is actually a really important story to tell, which is okay. a story about redemption. Love and it. And everyone deserves redemption. Synergy. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> so did you know how you wanted to use your voice for this role? Did you have anything in mind or did it sort of come to you organically in the moment? It was, it was an interesting one actually, deciding how Lucifer would talk. Um, when I first got the script, it was written by Tom Kapanos, the pilot script, who wrote mm. Californication, and he's kind of notorious for writing um, lovable rogues, I suppose. Mm. Um, so it didn't specify whether he was American, British, anything like that. Um, so my first instinct, because it was American pilot season, was to try it with an American accent. Um, and I did, and he just sounded like a dick, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so, uh, it, and, it, and it didn't quite, there was something not, not working on the page, and then I sort of started stripping it down. And it, the way that Tom had written it was, it really reminded me of kind of like an Oscar Wilde character or a, a Noel Coward character from that time right. of high style and people being very articulate and a sort of um, machine gun delivery of their, of their dialogue. Um, so th I took that sort of nugget and then the fact that he was this kind of playboy rocker, you know, into music, I thought, well, if Noel Coward and Mick Jagger had a love child, this is kind of my starting point for Lucifer. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, and that was basically it. And I think, you know, I was the only person who sort of made that connection. Yeah. And that's what stood me out from the other people. Well, I just don't, you know, seeing it happen live and being on set with you and, and watching the way that everybody works and the way that you work, I, I don't think that it would work with an American accent. I mean, really looking back at it. So it was well, a good choice. There was also the thing that I, you know, we wanted him to be from somewhere else because mm -hmm. he's not from Los Angeles. He's from hell, obviously. He's from hell. Uh, well, um, well, heaven <laughs> via hell. Um, yeah. But uh, so, you know, that, that sort of worked in that notion as well to yeah. make him a bit different. But I also realized that, you know, with a British accent in America, you can pretty much get away with saying anything and people just think you're charming. Yes. So 
is true. <laughs> there was that kind of Ask there was that assistant. kind of diffusing thing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's a good thing. So <laughs> so when you were preparing for this role. Um, did you feel like there was any, well, maybe not just the role, but in your career in general, did you feel like playing an instrument helped you in some way, that it served you in some way? Um, and when you're learning con to control your breathing, when you're singing, when you're doing anything in, as an actor, mm. did your musical background and your, your, your instrumental background, if you will, do you feel that played a, a part in helping you get to where you are now? Um, I, think, I think music has really helped my acting, um, uh, if I really strip it down, I think for me it's about rhythm. A lot of the time when I'm first sort of approaching a character or approaching um, dialogue on a page, most writers have a certain cadence that they write within um, and it's sort of tapping into that mm -hmm. uh, and you know, find the rhythm and then the tone of what the overall thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think music certainly helps like instinctively without even really thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, alluding back to why I do a playlist of music because it's, it's music is a language to me um, and it's a universal language and so I think that some somehow without even computing when I listen to something it gives it takes me somewhere and it gives me a feeling um, and that's that's where I, that's where my acting sort of process starts I love that because you definitely need both and we I teach mm. that all the time to my singers that I've often said that my singers are more difficult to train. My actors are easier. My actors are always easier because they know what it's like to step into somebody else's shoes. Mm. And they know what it's like to have to deal with empathy and, and, and step into a character. So oftentimes they're able to morph and to gel much, much more quickly. When I give them a song, they almost come at it from an actor's perspective. And yeah. so they're able to take their ego out of it. Where yeah. my singers are all about themselves and what they look like and how they sound. And as actors, I love watching them come in they're so professional yeah you know and they've, they've had that training in school so they understand how to break a song down and how to heart like really work hard so I really appreciate that it's one of the things I love about my job is seeing my actors because they do they just they they understand how important it is again to work hard but to really feel what it's like to be into another character and then the music translates in the same way so Absolutely. I love that you 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 touched on that um What's this journey been like? Which journey? I mean, just <laughs> what, what keeps you going in the industry and where nothing is guaranteed to you? No, nothing is guaranteed. I mean, I've been acting for nearly 20 years now. Mm. Um, and I think the thing that keeps me going is one, I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, once I decided that this is what I wanted to do, I really wanted to do it. And I, I, I was never going to settle for someone who just did bits and pieces here and there and, you know, had to work in a bar at night time to subsidize their income and stuff. Right. You know, much as I know people don't choose that, but it's something I just didn't want. And somehow I kind of like, I, I sort of bestowed positive feeling about it's going to be all right. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. And I've sort of, that's something I've had my entire life for some reason. Well, you're supposed to be in this business then. Yeah, I it once, kind of feels you know, like that did it for a while in my 20s we're all dabbling as musicians as singers and artists and I had a friend of mine who still works today and he said Valerie you know if you if I didn't do what I do if I couldn't be an actor or do he does stand up as mm -hmm. well if I couldn't do that I, I literally would fall into a hole of depression <laughs> I mean I have to do it it's a calling and if you don't feel that way you should get out yeah and you know I took his advice and I I stepped out and I focused on music and something that I felt passionate about but yeah. but I love that you tapped on that because you have to have that um that attitude well you've got to but you have to believe in yourself you've yeah. got to back yourself because ultimately if you don't back yourself no one else is going to that's right but it's such a difficult industry in order to maintain that attitude because you're consistently rejected right. you know there, you, there is an inordinate amount of rejection that you have to put up with yet maintain the fact that you 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 have a unique quality right. and that's the thing believing that your quality is unique and you have something to offer that other people don't and not saying that you're better right. than people or anything right. like that just different well, one of the things that I love about that is you're an example to me of somebody who is, I always tell this to all my clients, you are committed to your process. You're not attached to the outcome. Yeah. And that's what makes you so successful and many, many more years of that to come, I think. Fingers crossed. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, so, Tom... I think it would be fun to let listeners and viewers kind of get a 
I don't know, sort of a, an eye into how we met. And I was asking my assistant about it on the way because I had forgotten half the story. So I was hoping <laughs> that you could fill it in. Because well, we met, we met originally on Skype. Do you remember? Yeah, you were, it, so, were you in London? No, I was in Vancouver. Oh, that's right. I was in okay. Vancouver and they'd, uh, they'd written this episode that opened with the cinema and the Nina Simone song. And um, uh, Jonathan Brody, our post-production supervisor, put right. me in touch with you. Right. And we, we did a couple of sessions on Skype. Right, that's right. Okay, now thank you for jogging my memory. <laughs> It's a, it's a senior moment. I don't know. It's all happening. <laughs> we all have them. But yeah, I, I, so I wanted to know as far as your career, what you're excited about in the future. I know that you and I have had some pretty, and we've had some pretty intense conversations um, yeah. about your singing and how you feel about it and being a dad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you a bit more about that and your struggles um, being an actor and being here in LA and just a little bit more about that. So, um, in terms of like, in terms of the singing side of things, um, n- now that you know we've struck up this relationship, and you know we've talked to not just about this is now for me not just about singing songs on Lucifer. This is about moving forward in my career as well. Right. Um, I kind of you know I've always harbored a desire to do musicals, um, a good musical. Um, but again, it was a confidence thing. Yeah. I just thought, oh, I'm not that person because I'm not a musical theatre person. Right. Um, that's sort of done a complete U-turn in the last few years. And I now feel like that's, you know, it's a mission of mine to, mm. you know, London, Broadway. I mean, I've never worked in New York, so I'd love to go and work on Broadway at some point. And if it was a musical, that would be, a, you know, yeah. a lot of boxes ticked at the same time. And I think that, you know, one of the first things that I noticed about you when we met, just vocally, the tone that you have on your instrument and the voice that you have, I even think I remember saying to you, you have to do Broadway. I mean, yeah. it was just a no-brainer for somebody listening to you on the outside, all the while knowing we had a lot of work to do because you had a, you were you one of those singers that sort of flew by the seat of your pants. You mm-hmm. knew you had a great voice and you were good, but the currency and the longevity was not there because well, you have to train yeah, like I, you are. I had no vocal stamina at right. all. So like mm-hmm. we would do a session and then I would be really hoarse for like a day afterwards. Right. Um, just because I'm just, you know, it's like, like you say, it's like going to the gym. Mm-hmm. An athlete doesn't just turn up and do the 100 meters. They, they train and train and train, and then they turn up and they knock it out of the park. Right. And you've got, to, you've got to do the same thing with singing. And you have to understand how your anatomy works and yeah. how your voice works. And, you know, um, I'm always telling clients, you know, just because you can sing doesn't mean you understand and know your anatomy and how to use that anatomy properly. So there's a lot of technique and technology that goes into that. There's a lot of, like I said, vocal currency. And like mm-hmm. you said, just being an athlete and understanding yeah. that singers are athletes. You know, actors are athletes in a way. They're working a muscle. But singers are working actual physical muscles. Yeah. And so imparting on you, we can do the Broadway thing, but we got we got some work well, to do. Well, eight shows a week. Yeah. You've, got to, you, you, you've really got to have the stamina there. And, yeah, yeah. Um, that takes time. Yeah. You know, like, like being in the gym, if you want to get to a certain point. You've got to put the time in. Yeah, and you are in the gym now. I am in the gym now. I mean, now. you've, you've Well, that morphed. was one of the first things you said to me as well. Yeah. It was like, I, you know, you told me that you'd started lifting and that really sort of changed, yeah. you know, made you very positive in that direction and, mm. and put you in a good stead every day. Yeah. Um, and so I've started doing that now. Yeah, yeah. And well, I, I, can, I concur. It shows. It shows. <laughs> it's, it's all working for you. So future, anything in the future that you, other than Broadway, that you'd like to do? Where do you see yourself? Um, I mean, I, I've always, I mean, one of the things that I love about acting is the variety. So I always want to go and do something different from what I've just been doing. So mm. um, I just uh, shot on a show that my fiance wrote, actually, uh, which, uh, which will be out later this year. Um, and then I kind of, you know, I want to start maybe doing some more movie work. Yeah. Um, but I will always go back to the theatre because it's my love. And for yeah. me, as an actor, I feel like re- uh, theatre is like rehab for acting mm. because the, the nature of film and TV and the way that you shoot isn't the most organic process. Um, but theatre, you, you go on and that's it. <laughs> I love that you said that because it goes back to music for me Yeah. Um, and, and singers for me that, again, you said that the theatre is the, is the place where you get to experiment and mm-hmm. be a better actor. I feel like singing is the same way as actors. Sometimes they rest on their laurels and maybe they're not in class as much as they should be and they're just going part to part to part, but they're, not, they're really missing all the square footage of their ability to be a better actor or to be more organic or 
sort of get a different role. And I think singers fall into that trap too, yeah. where they're given this natural voice, um, but they stop figuring out and learning how to use it. And so their careers kind of stop and they're like, I don't understand why. Yeah. Because you have to work at everything that you do. You've got to put, well, I mean, again, going back to what is it about acting that I love or why, you know, why would I continue doing it? It's something my dad said to me. My dad reads a lot of books, mm -hmm. and he he <laughs> turned to me after one of my first jobs and said, "Just remember what they say about novelists: you're only as good as your next book." Yeah. And I was like, "Okay." And uh, as, in terms of a work ethic, you know, I just want to get better. Yeah. And I just want to improve all the time. And, and you know, whether it's just in acting or whether it's in music, you know, I've started you know playing guitar now and mm -hmm. trying to improve on that. Just. Because it kind of makes me happy. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, I get music it. Music makes me happy. Yeah, and it does. Music is, it's a vibration. It's an yeah. energy. It sort of makes the world go around. So I'm glad when people who are artistic can see the two and have the time to really focus on, on both of those, those things together. Yeah. Um, when's the wedding? Next year. Next summer. Exciting. I know. Well, congratulations. I'm really happy for you. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah. It's be very, we've, got, we've just booked an amazing band as well. So I'm very oh, happy. good. Oh, good. Are you, are you going to get up and sing? I might do. Oh, okay. <laughs> I will have to prepare something in class. Remind sure. me. All right. <laughs>